All right, welcome to a new lecture. This one is about uh, chapter seven. That's gonna be the evolutionary game theory. So uh, let's get to it. All right, evolutionary game theory. What are we talking about? We're talking about the idea that individuals in a social network can exhibit different forms of behavior. And a lot of times in this chapter, it seems like the authors have gone sort of off the deep end talking about beetles but we are gonna bring it right back to uh, social networks, probably in the later, uh, starting in the next chapter. But for now, bear with us talking about beetles and uh, how they survive during evolution. What we're doing here with evolutionary game theory is talking about the forms of behavior that are gonna persist in the environment and that some forms of behavior might have a tendency to be driven out. Example I'm showing here, this lovely one is about beetles with horns versus beetles that don't have horns. And if you know the end of that story, it was the beetles with horns drove the other ones out. All right, so what we're talking about with evolutionary theory is this idea of fitness. And fitness means the behavior will survive. We are most interested here in when two sort of quote organisms or nodes in our network interact and we want to see what behaviors persist or will tend to persist in the network as different people in the network choose them sort of in combination. This is a lot like normal game theory, but there's big crucial difference. Number one difference right now is both players are gonna have the same strategy. So there's symmetric, at least in, well, they're symmetric in two ways. One is both uh, actors or both nodes will have the same two strategies. What I'm showing here is the hunt stag one. So either hunter can choose from stag or hare. The second issue is, we'll talk about this a little more later, the payoffs need to be the same. So the combinations in the matrix need to be symmetric sort of along the axis there. The big reason we're doing this as a topic is that this can be used to model some kind of cool situations. And one of them is that we have situations in a network where the players don't really get to choose their strategy. It's sort of forced upon them. We talked a long time ago about immutable characteristics or just contextual characteristics. And sometimes people in a network will just have the characteristic and that will determine, you know, whether or not an edge exists, whether or not a trade happens. Uh, there's various things there. And sort of on the flip side of that is, yes, we have situations where players do determine what their strategy will be. And those kind of situations for us sort of start to decide whether or not um, edges continue to exist or you know, edges are even employed. So continuing this idea, what we're also wanting to do here is have a longer term focus. In the previous chapter, it was more about it almost, it was almost like a one-off situation where the players are examining a single shot uh, decision. And yes, we gave these assumptions of uh, sort of rationality, etc. And we tried to say, well, doing it over time will tend toward re rationality. Now is when we're saying the long term happens. Okay. When we can do these evolutionarily stable strategy or this evolutionary game theory and to establish what's happening in the long term or over a large population, um, sort of the statistics here just bear it, bear itself out, okay? So we got a long-term focus, strategy over time. So being used over time, the same two players meet, same two nodes meet, or uh, you know, if a million nodes in the population randomly meet a million different nodes in the population, you know, what do we expect is gonna go on? All right, I'm noting here again, the symmetric um, results matrix. So we're symmetric here. You got the same two strategies and the results are symmetric. Meaning if, you know, it's like the rock, paper, scissors game almost. Someone chooses rock, the other one chooses paper, is the same reward to you 
as if uh, I chose rock and you chose paper. Symmetric. All right, speaking of more symmetric matrices, let's talk about an evolutionarily stable strategy. So we're starting from one assumption here, that is that the whole population is using this strategy. It's gonna be on our matrix here, it's gonna be that top left strategy. And we're gonna say, okay, look, given that the whole population is hunting stag, if all of a sudden some people appear that hunted hare, would hunting stag die off over time? So the new people that are hunting hare, those would be the migrants. They would might, or we, they just might have been people that you know came from another place, or you might call them mutants. That's kind of a mean thing to say, but it's you know in biology it's like a mutation that all of a sudden people decide they're going to hunt hare. Okay, so speaking of evolutionarily stable strategy. If everyone in the population right now is hunting stag and all of a sudden some number of people came in that hunted hare, let's say a small number, would hunting um, stag survive as a strategy? And if it would, then it's evolutionarily stable. Okay, so evolutionarily stable means that that strategy will survive against an invader. If you look at the matrix here, and you might remember this from the previous chapter, there's actually two equilibria. One is that hunting stag um, is the best response to hunt, strict best response to hunting stag. And hunting hare is the uh, best response um, to um, hunting hare also. And so we did have two Nash equilibria here, and then we'll talk about the other issues later. But bottom line here is hunting stag would survive. Now we're gonna talk about why. All right, the why is math, of course, and um, it has to do with the best response and strict best responses. So first issue, if all the edges are currently S, probability of encountering an edge T is zero. If the edge type T develops as an invader with some minor fraction of the population, S is going to continue to exist as a strategy if S is a strict best response to S. Remember here, if I'm organism one and I'm choosing, you know, I know organism two has good odds, 99% odds of choosing S, I'm going to choose S if A is greater than C. Like that's a guarantee. So in that case, S, S remains a, or S is going to be a evolutionarily stable strategy. Now, if they're equal, that is, you remember back to the last chapter, we had this idea of best response, not strict best response. So if A and C are equal, and T is not the strict best response to T. So if we look down at this lower end here, if you have a situation where T is the best response, um, or that it exists as an option, but T is not sort of a dominant strategy here, then we need to do some more math. And we got more math needed because we're awesome. We love doing math. All right, more math. So if S is not a strict best response to T, that is A is equal to C, and if T is not a strict best response to T, that is D is less than or equal to B, then strategy S is gonna be evolutionarily stable if the payoff for choosing S is better at random than choosing T. So now we need to think about what is the probability of encountering T. Remember before it was, if A is greater than C, then S just makes sense to continue if, if there's S is around, you know, it's just gonna continue as a possible strategy. Here we're going on the idea that it might, you know, there might be situations where it makes sense to choose T. And here we got to worry about, okay, what's the probability of someone that's already on S, what's the probability they're going to hit somebody choosing T? So we might've talked about this earlier of this person being, you know, you might have a 10% probability of seeing someone that's um, choosing T. And so that's the, you know, like, we have a 90% probability, if we choose S, we have a 90% probability of scoring that A payoff. If the other person at 10% chooses T, then we have a 10% probability of getting that B payoff. We're not done doing math. So that's our expected payoff of choosing S. 
what if we choose t? We have to make the calculations, or we assume people are going to make the calculations, or the calculation will be done for them of choosing t. If the probability of encountering t, remember, was that 10%? The expected payoff of choosing t is going to be c. So we're in now with organism 1 in the bottom left. That's our payoff is c at a 90% probability or it's a 10% probability of, of getting a D payoff. So now we're in the bottom row. That is, you know, we got some minor probability of picking T. Now, now it's time to make a decision. The edge type of S is evolutionarily stable if the payoff for choosing S makes the inequality true. So if it's greater to choose S, given some probability that you're going to encounter T, then S will continue to be evolutionarily stable. It will continue as a strategy. All right, so that was the kind of general form of the thing. Now let's get into just a little bit more specifics here. So here's some just specific things we can say about that formula. If we're starting out in a situation where all the edges are currently type S, then in that situation, the probability of a node encountering an edge T is zero. If edge T develops, so strategy T develops, as an invader, S is going to continue to exist for sure if S is a strict best response to T. We already talked about that before. So if A is greater than C, it just makes sense to continue using S as a strategy. In our formula, what's happened here is we have an X very near to zero. So that's where the if A is greater than C uh, comes from. Working on a little further from there, if all the edges, so if we start out with all the edges type T, then the probability of encountering an edge T is basically 1. So if edge of type S develops or invades, this is kind of a weird way to think about it, S is going to continue to exist if S is a best response to T, so if they're at least equal and A equals C, and if T is not a strict best response to T. Now remember, if S is a strict best response to T, it's already going to happen for sure. But in this situation, we're talking about a situation where S could continue to exist even if it's kind of a weak response to T. So if T is not super powerful, S is going to continue to exist. So this is the situation where we're only like 0.01% of people are choosing S. And that's why we can cancel out, you know, X is nearly 1, and the A and the C basically come, become canceled out. And that's where if A is not greater than C, if A is just equal to C, then we have to look at this B being greater than D. So this is all the math that derives everything for us, and it leads us to these general rules. S is evolutionarily stable when either A is greater than C, so it's evolutionarily stable there, it's going to stick, or A equals C, and then B is greater than D. So we have a you know, that sort of minor little payoff there. This is math, and this is something we're going to use um, later when we're talking about, you know, people choosing various technologies. This might be like, hey, um, I want, I'm thinking about using a Mac, but there's Windows users out there, and there's a certain payoff that so many people use Windows, and I'm only going to use a Mac, and, you know, these kind of things interact, and we can predict mathematically whether or not the various strategies are going to continue. So thinking about large beetle, small beetle, let's walk through a couple of examples here. And we're talking about here the S, so the small beetle. The small beetle would be evolutionarily stable if A was greater than C, and it's not, or A equals to C and B greater than D. Uh, so small beetle is not evolutionarily stable. If large beetle comes into existence, large beetle wins as a strategy basically every time, and so small beetle is going to go out of existence. All right, so another interesting thing that we can find here is that evolutionarily stable strategies are also Nash equilibria. So anytime you're actually in one of these symmetric games and you want to compute what are the Nash equilibria, like the one way you can do it for sure, one easy shortcut to find at least a couple, is to compute you know, whether or not these are evolutionarily stable. So in the hunt stag, uh, hunt hare game, 
You might remember last chapter that we had the 4, 4, and the 3, 3 that were uh, Nash equilibria. And what you'll see in this is they are both evolutionarily stable according to this game. So here we got A greater than C, that's 4 being greater than 3. If we flip the matrix and put hunt hare, hunt hare in the corner, then it's going to be 3 is greater than 0. So in that case, we got two Nash equilibria, and both of those are evolutionarily, both strategies are evolutionarily stable. In the beetle situation, we already said that small, small is not a Nash equilibrium, and large, large is a Nash equilibrium. And here's where we got to emphasize Nash equilibrium. The idea of you know the Nash equilibrium is that people choose these as being the best response. But if you're going to say you know beetles, like it's just there's only like they are either large or they're small, and the small ones just en end up losing out. And so it's not really a choice here. So it's um, kind of a funny way to call it to call it a Nash equilibrium. So this an evolutionarily stable, I guess the point. Here is that they're just not, there's not really a Nash equilibrium idea. It's just, is it going to stick around or not? All right, let's go a little nuts on the hunt stag, hunt, hunt, uh, hunt hare. It is possible to have a Nash equilibrium that's not evolutionarily stable. This is just as interesting as our ideas back before about Pareto on socially optimal. And that is, you can end up in a situation where the actual like existence of what's going on, you know, it may exist for a while and then just sort of blink out of existence. So when you have a situation when A equals C and B is less than D, then the Nash equilibrium is not evolutionarily stable. So we got a situation here where, you know, hunting hare ends up being just a little bit better if you do it alone, so if someone's hunting stag and you decide to hunt hare, like you still get as much meat, I guess, as hunting stag, and maybe you like being alone better. <laughs> I don't know what this is. We're just making up numbers here, obviously. But the idea here is an additional benefit to hunting hare alone makes hunting stag not evolutionarily stable because now we've got best response. Hunting hare is a best response if the other person hunts stag, you get just as good a payoff by hunting hare. If you know the other person is hunting hare, you have just as good a uh, payoff to hunting hare also. Okay, so in this situation, if you do, you know, your a um, a equals c, and b is not greater than d, and so in this situation, hunting stag is not evolutionarily stable. However, hunting stag is still the best response to hunting stag. And so it's, you know, looking at the game itself, it is a Nash equilibrium. But I guess that um, gets us to this larger point that is, if you had 100% of people that were hunting stag, and all of a sudden one person comes along that's like, hey, look at this cool little thing, we can hunt hare, then you know people are going to hunt stag for a while but you know sort of bit by bit the hunt hare um, strategy is going to erode the hunt uh, stag strategy so that's like the yeah i mean you probably know that examples in real life all right uh that's it